In part A, in order for us to try to have a bit of visualization, I think it is a good idea for us to sketch an arbitrary curve to represent the X and Y intercept. So let's say here we have the Y axis and let's say this is the X axis. I'm going to sketch my arbitrary curve, which is this over here. And this point here, which is the X intercept will be A0. And this point here will be 0B. So in part one, the curve is going to undergo the transformation fx minus b. So it is going to be a translation of b units in the negative y direction. So this point here is going to be translated by b units in the y direction. So the x coordinate remain the same as for the y coordinate is going to be b minus b, which will give us a zero. And this will be the only x and y intercept for part one. As for part two, in part two, it is going to undergo this transformation, y is going to f a x. So the transformation will be a scaling by a factor of one over a parallel to the x-axis. So for this point here, it is going to become a over a zero, which is going to become a point one zero. So this will be the new x, x, uh, x intercept. As for the y intercept, there's no change to it because the original y x coordinates here is going to be zero, zero divided by a is still going to be zero. So the y intercept will remain at 0b. In part 1, we are supposed to show that the composite function hg exists. So I'm going to make use of the same schematic that I've always been using on the Chivers TV and all the videos that we have been producing. So hg, I'm going to represent it using my schematic here where x first goes into g then after that it is going to go into h. So in order for hg to exist, we are analyzing the part where they are being connected together. And I just want to make sure that everything that comes out from g, which is represented by the range of g, they must go into, entirely go into the what h can receive, which is going to be represented by the domain of h. So what we are going to do is to try to analyze numerically what is the range of g and the domain of h. In fact, this is always going to exist because the domain of h, according to what the question has given to us, the domain of h is all real numbers. So it should accept everything. But we still need to do a numerical proof. So let's tr first try to find the range of g. And to do that, let's sketch a graph that represents y is equal to gx so that we can make use of the graph to find the range of g. So we have a graph that is uh, going to have a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote. This is going to be a graph of a rational expression. The vertical asymptote is based on this. The vertical asymptote is x is equal to 1. And here we have the horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptote is equal to 3. So y is equal to 3 over here. And based on what I have on the calculator, we will have a graph that looks something like this. And this. Okay, so based on my graph, we can then now read the range of g. It is all the possible y coordinates that is on this curve. So it's going to be from minus infinity to 3, but not inclusive of 3, and from 3 all the way until infinity. This represents for us the range of g. As for the domain of h, which is all real numbers, it is just going to be from minus infinity to infinity. So this is definitely a subset. Based on this, we can then conclude that the composite function h g exists. B part 2, let's first try to find the expression for hg. So for hg, I'm going to be putting g into h. So h is this. So putting g into h is going to be replacing the x that is here by the entire expression of g. So here we have a 3 minus 1 over x minus 1. So what we have gotten is a minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1. And the next part is actually quite interesting. We are supposed to hands find this. Find hg inverse, hg as a function inverse of 3. So the question says, hence find hg inverse of 3, which means that we need to make use of what we have previously, but this is an inverse. So in order for me to make use of the previous part, I'm going to let this be equal to, let's say, k. So my aim is to find k, and I'm going to bring this inverse over to the right-hand side. So 3 is going to be equal to hg of k. So 3 is going to be equal to hg we have found in the previous part. It is minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1. And I'm going to re replace this x here by k. So it is going to be k minus 1. Let's try to solve for this. So 1 over k minus 1. This is equal to 4. Cross multiplying, 1 is equal to 4k minus 4. So 4k here is equal to 5. 
which tells me that k is equal to 5 over 4. Hey, what is k? k is actually this. So therefore, we can then conclude that hg inverse, k is equal to this, h3 inverse of, sorry, hg inverse of 3 is going to be equal to, now we have solved it, 5 over 4.